Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. Like the cicadas, we're here. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Donnybrook. Great to have you with us. Lots to talk about. Let's meet the panelists. There's Wendy Weiss from the Big 550 KTRS, along with Bill McClellan from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. From the Riverfront Times and its sister publications, Sarah Fenske and Alvin Reed from the St. Louis American. Well, you guys have been on this WashU pro-Palestinian protesters story for you know, a week or so, kind of yeah. like uh, all over like a bad suit, as we used to say. But uh, what, what's happened last week? The pro-Palestinian protesters have asked that Jennifer Coolidge, the commencement speaker, not speak. Washington University has surrounded its campus with a big fence. You've been reporting that WashU asked students or others to act as, as you call them, tattletales, to be videographers at some of the demonstrations. And the Post is reporting today, maybe you guys too, Sarah, that uh, at least one grad student is being denied a diploma uh, during graduation ceremonies next Monday. So what are your opinions on all of this? Is WashU acting appropriately, an example for the rest of academia, or is it making a mistake? I mean, there's a lot of just tension right now on the WashU campus. I feel like any time you have to put a, a wall up to keep people in or keep people out, it's just a bad sign. You know, there's there's something that doesn't love a wall. Like, this is against the, the human nature that we want the freedom we want to feel. So I think it's just kind of sad. I feel bad for these students who came up during uh, COVID when they started their college career, and now they're ending on this fenced-in campus where people have to show IDs to get in and out. I remember being a college student you know just freely walking through the fields you know go to the bar come home the idea of showing your ID just to get onto the campus it just feels antithetical to how Wash U is sort of positioning itself as, as being in St. Louis caring about St. Louis it's now kind of a fortress until we get through commencement uh, okay yeah. well I, I was gonna say uh, poor Wash U though everybody you know they should be more part of the community and then their 13th festival got canceled because the community came in and we get start, started brawling. Yeah, and right. So, so I have some sympathy for Wash U not wanting all of the non-students to come on and protest. And, uh, yeah, well, no. what were, I'm sorry, but what were yeah. the numbers? Like out of 100, there were 24 students, maybe four faculty members, and the rest were just outside yeah. agitators. So those were of the people that got arrested. Mm. There were a whole lot of people who were at that protest who didn't get arrested, who dispersed at various points after warnings were given. I don't think you can draw a clear line that like, you know, the very worst people got arrested and everyone who didn't get arrested was lawfully obeying. There were clearly some people that weren't students, weren't faculty. There were also a lot of alumni there. You know, there are people that live in this city, care about Wash U, and showed up for that protest. So, I don't know. I just, you know, some of these measures, they had a, an email that went out to the law school that said, when you show up for graduation, you're going to have to unzip your regalia. Um, you know, basically show that you you don't have any political messages is where we think this was headed, underneath your robe. Like... I don't know. Well, I, I mean, know. it could I don't be even that worse unusual. than that. I mean, I, I went could... to Maryville's uh, graduation on Saturday, and you had to uh, empty your pockets <laughs> and go through a metal detector, and there was nothing political about the uh, ceremony whatsoever. It went out without a hitch. But I, don't you think that Wash U doesn't want to have to cancel its graduation, as yes. some have, uh, doesn't want encampments on campus forever and a day, and it's their private property? Uh, you, you say they don't want people to look in maybe they don't want the people who are inside to look out at the protesters well, that's why they put up the fence but that wouldn't bother me as far as me graduating um i, I think I, I really wish that that fence wasn't there yeah. okay i think if i were president of any university i would think to myself whatever's going to go down it's going to go down we got it some way i'm not i'm not fencing off my property however this is a private school as opposed to i'm sure. more in tune with with public schools you made a good note it just reminded me of something last weekend i was uh back you know at my school and just for like a ring ceremony for the graduating 
athletes and I really thought it was cool. I mean, I seriously had not been on campus near graduation since graduation, you know. And yeah, you know, it's like, golly, there's 90% of everybody who wants is graduating just wants to just graduate and have this special day. So I, I don't blame Wash U for putting up the fence, but I just really, really, really wish they didn't. Um, I don't have a problem with them withholding if I, if the school decided that your behavior was such, we'll mail you your diploma. I'd probably think to myself, good, I ain't got to go to jail. Just right. <laughs> make Be sure you have the right address. Because they're investigating. They, you know, they said the disciplinary part of it will have to be investigated before you get your diploma. And in turn, and I know I sound like a broken record, but when it comes to the fences and all of this security. Some of these kids are descendants of the six million who perished in the Holocaust. So their their sense of, of fear, I think, is is real. And I think it is, you know, it, it's something that is justified. I mean, that fear is justified, in my opinion. And if Washington University, for them to act on that fear, they are doing what they should be doing. Let me ask you about the state auditor, Scott Fitzpatrick. Wendy, uh, he has asked people who might be able to find the former circuit attorney uh, for the city of St. Louis, Kim Gardner, to call his hotline or email him or call an 800 number because he's trying to wrap up an audit of her office that was actually started by his predecessor, Nicole Galloway. And despite readying the subpoenas, he can't find her. He called her lawyer in this town. The lawyer said, we're not with her anymore. They gave the auditor the number for the uh, her lawyer in Washington, D.C., they wouldn't return any phone calls. So he's asking for public support. Is is that a little bit going too far? It sounds like, it sounds a little reminiscent of Dog the Bounty Hunter, like we should put her <laughs> her face on a poster and put it up on telephone poles. Um, but I kind of understand what he's doing, because if you ask the family of Janelle Edmondson um, about what was going on in the, the circuit attorney's office and Daniel Riley and a um, a, a hundred bond hearings or what have you that he that were not uh, taken care of, then I think, yeah, it, it's worthy of an investigation. Oh, I, I think this is just so silly political. I mean, it's like Kim Gardner is a gift that doesn't stop giving. <laughs> yeah. and, and the Republicans just can't believe their bad fortune that Kim Gardner is gone and Gabriel <laughs> Gore is doing a good job. So all of a sudden they have to dig up we're going to exhume the body yeah. of Kim Gardner <laughs> right. and, and poke at her, see I, if it moves. And no, there's I, nothing that you can do to her. That that was basically, all you could do is probably try to remove her from office. You're going to have a tough time doing that. She resigned. She's gone. This is political. Also, Mr. Auditor, how much have you spent on this investigation? I'd like to know, because you could have offered me half of it and said, like, Alvin, I need her found. And I said, like, I'd have called within a week and said, like, hey, she's right there. You can find anybody you want to find if you're serious but about finding But you seriously finding. don't think that there needs to be any further investigation what, what of what you, went wrong that she did the circuit a, attorney's office? No, she was... I mean, she, I know she's she gone. She was terrible. I know she's she was gone. a horrible, right. horrible, horrible <laughs> elected <laughs> official. Look, but the <laughs> <scout, laughs> <laughs> auditor, like him or not, has a job. He's supposed to audit, and she's not cooperating. She was a public official. Why are you cutting her some slack? Well, I, I, I would argue with this, is, because if you're an auditor, you you know, your Kim Gardner type is not the person who has the detailed financial information. The, you should be combing through those records. You yeah. should be tracking down the people who have the invoices and who paid the bills. How much do you want to bet Kim Gardner doesn't even know the answer to these questions? She's, right. you know, she's at well, the top of this organization. She's not in the weeds, which is where then, he should be. Well, then she'll say as much. She'll tell him, I don't know. Oh, I didn't oh, handle this or that. Charlie, they would drag that testimony on forever. <laughs> don't forget, it was the citizens of St. Louis City, and I think you're the only panelist who lives in the city, <laughs> thank, who, thank you, Charlie. who asked true. for this audit. <laughs> no, and I want the audit. I am all for this audit continuing. Just as what long as the... I would love to see the audit wrap up, but guess what? There are frequently audits where people who are key people don't cooperate because they're worried about the potential for charges or pushback or whatever, and the thing an auditor is supposed to do is still get to the bottom of the books. I want to see this auditor do his job not hold a press conference. Agreed. All right, Alvin, let me ask you about, um, uh, in the city of St. Louis, they're talking about setting aside $350,000 to help people who are 
running around, driving around with expired temporary tags to pay their sales tax and their insurance, something that most people pay out of their own pockets. Should the taxpayers pay for the sales tax and insurance on cars that don't have current registrations? Absolutely not, because a large percentage of those folks, I'm sorry, would never pay the city back. I mean, that's throwing good money after bad. Uh, also, keep in mind, a lot of the people have, their cars could not pass the inspection to get the sticker. So how does that work? I mean, I, that's a question I would have about it too. But the biggest problem with, with it is people would renege. I, I'm just, I'm sorry, but I think that's... Uh, it, it's a state problem. The, the state has to make it so that when you buy a car, you pay the tax when you buy the car. I mean, I've never, you know, I've lived in other states and I've never had a situation like this where you buy the car and then, oh, you owe us, you know, $2,800 on tax. And it, well, I don't have that. Well, here's your car anyway. Right. This, this is the state problem. And what's really crazy is it's been remedied, right? But yeah. it's, it's just still in the pipeline. They're trying to get the computer, the, the computer programs that they need uh, to, to make yeah, it you work. They remedied. They passed the bill saying right. that we're going to do this, we're gonna but, do but this. they can't get it together. They can't get all the parts moving at the same time. But uh, what, what I, are able to They do it, do it right there at right. the dealership. Yeah. Exactly. You can't drive <laughs> they just off the lot you're right. without it. Exactly. But what I, I thought was just unbelievable was the, the spokesperson for the Tashara Jones administration, somebody at City Hall said that they're trying to take a holistic approach. And I thought, this is not a chest cold. I mean, this is, you know, this is a real emergency. This is a civic emergency. You don't take a holistic approach, in my opinion, to something like this. Well, I think you could. Yeah. But once again, there, this is a program that's giving a loan to people. To people. And that, that you're automatically... There's a percentage of people in America that have either a very difficult time or never repay a loan. So you know by doing this, you know that you're costing yourself money because you are not, not going to get all the money not back. just now, but in the future, because it, you're mm. saying to people, hey, you know what? Yeah, yeah. It's all right. What does we'll our only city resident think about <laughs> it? <laughs> no. I just, we need to get you a sash. I, I, only I, a city really, resident. I have a lot of doubts that the city can competently execute this program, but I have to say, I do like the intentions here. We have made it impossible in this metro area to get around without a car, and so it is so hard to be a member of the working poor in in St. Louis because you're trying to get a car, you're trying to get enough money to pay sales tax. It's very hard to get an affordable and car these I, days. Those prices have skyrocketed. And I, I just, just the fact that you can't just roll that into a loan, which you could do if you were purchasing it from a dealer, is a problem. We, we, we don't know for sure that all the people who are delinquent are indigent. Oh, sure. We don't I know their that. spending habits I get or that. where else they're putting their and money. And when I see a fancy and car with yeah, $50,000 Bill says it's a state minivans. problem. In yeah. other states, they enforce this locally. For example, it's true. There's no such thing as a temporary tag in many states. But after two years or whatever it is, that plate expires. And you have to renew it with your personal property tax payment or by uh, showing proof of insurance, that sort of thing. And to make sure that people are in compliance, Compliance, cities like New York City put boots on cars and you get the boot off when you have everything paid up. Yeah, and I, I want to add that this is a thing that where the heart is in the right place. I, you should always sit down and how do we address a problem and try to come up with some kind of, you know, humane way of doing it. I just don't think this will work to the point that it will, it will be a financial setback. But I do applaud them for at least trying. Well, I like Charlie's inhumane way. <laughs> <laughs> Find the poor people and put a boot on them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The working it, poor. It, if you believe that they're all poor, and I see expired plates on Wydown, which oh, is not on, generally in poor exactly. neighborhoods. Exactly. I'm well, town and country minivans, which are not. I, I would mean, like to see the Clayton police get on that, Charlie. That, I think, yeah. would be a good use of all these I, different police departments that we have. But when it comes to the city of St. Louis, I think a lot of these cases are very much popular. Poverty cases, and I think the cops could sort that out if they went around and tried to ticket some sports cars with temporary tags. I'm sure they have poor in other cities too, yep. but somehow they managed to pay for their plates. Now, but the problem is the sales tax in this state is so high. You know, you go to Florida, it's five, six percent, but here it's around ten percent, which brings me to some other issue. I think. Oh yeah, should we raise the sales tax in order to pay for early childhood education? That's what the city of St. Louis wants to do. Sarah, are you in favor of that? Yeah. I mean
mean, I think this is a bad bill. I really do. Like, to raise the sales tax even higher when this is a really regressive tax that hits poor people the hardest, and then you're going to create this fund. I think the mental health board would administer it, and you're giving grants to various uh, daycare providers and people who do early childhood education. It's like these are a lot of private entities, nonprofits around the city providing this child care. I don't know that it makes sense to start giving tax dollars to them when we're going to be taking those tax dollars out of the pockets of some of our poorest citizens. I just think that you're a little bit late to the sales tax party. So many have been stacked upon yeah. whenever. Now, 20 years ago, you wanted to do this, and it was at 6% or something like that. Maybe it could, the, the voters could consider it. I don't think it would pass because it's just too high. Plus, before I did this, I mean every early childhood center in the city would have to be inspected from top to bottom because I think a lot of them are skirting by anyway, mm. and I just think that before you gave out a dime in any way, shape, or form, you have to be up to a certain standard. Are we looking at a future series by the St. Louis American or something? <laughs> I, <was gonna> say, <laughs> I don't know. No. Oh, no. I, we'd like having a St. Louis right, American. Office. Well, Bill, what do, you, what do you think of the plan? Because they can't find enough school bus drivers in the city of St. Louis, they're going to give families $75 weekly gift cards to drive their own kids to school. I think that sounds like a fine plan. I, re I, I really do. I mean, if, if the kids can't get to school on the bus, they got to get them somewhere. Got to get there somehow. And to encourage the parents to get their kids there, and uh, presumably these are people who don't have a lot of money, paying them to take their kids to school, I think it's a good idea. And, and maybe they can take some of that money and get their plates, you know, <laughs> up to date. But, but I, I, it, it sounds great. You, you have to get the kids to school. Well, we all walked to you. You're too young to remember. <laughs> the four of us, we all walked to school. Oh, uh, neighborhood hills, schools, four miles that's a whole different With thing. holes in our shoes in the snow. Um, I think it's a great idea. For some reason, I'm worried about liability. Like, um, would that, w w could that come back to bite the city? Well, you want to talk about liability. You, you know, know, before they turned to this parent plan, they were actually putting these kids in taxis. Oh, gosh. And I know some parents who had St. Louis public school children being put in taxis to being driven across town. That's a nightmare. Yeah, that's, that's... So, to me, this is such an imperfect solution. Now, wh now why is that a nightmare? Kids in the transfer program who are in after-school activities, extracurriculars, they took taxis for... Oh, these are like, like five-year-olds. These are little kids. These are five-year-olds. Have you talked to many of our local taxi drivers? There's some that are lovely, but I don't know that I want my five-year-old riding in a taxi figuring out where she's supposed to get off. She is not smart enough to, to be the boss of that situation. Well, how about the parents driving, though? Well, hey, you get how you get there. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> I, I, you know, hire a new fleet of drivers, and you have to be like an Uber person you know, and pass some type of scrutiny. And then also, how do you verify that the parent drove enough to warrant the $75? But I think you could figure that out. Maybe give them a punch hey, card do, and do, you I have to get too. it punched. But I think you could figure that out. Certainly the child has to be at school. I mean, right. that's the first thing. Well, Unless that's right. the parent also has to be at work. The child has to be on time and has to arrive at least four days that week. Hmm. All right. So, yeah, but, but now how you only 80%. It should be five out of five for sure. And they're still looking, apparently, st still looking at contracts with various bus companies. So maybe this will resolve itself. Well, well this should uh, light a fire under the bus companies mm -hmm. if all of a sudden parents say, hey, you know, it was nice to just... Uh, take little Sam out here and have him get on the bus, but I'm getting paid now hmm. to take Sam. Alvin Reed, I want to ask you, Mike Florio, a football analyst, says that because of the great number of fans attending Battle Hawks games, you know, between 30 and 40,000, that St. Louis should be considered for an NFL franchise. I, you know, I like Mike Florio. I've sent him some emails. Um, I did, good reading to have Sirius Radio, not to do a plug for them, but that's the only way you can find it because I'm not going to subscribe to Peacock. I think he may be onto something. To sh it does show that you know there's interest in football in St. Louis. Okay, however, I don't know that that translates to the big money and big 
lifetime ticket price and all that. I really, really, really want a team here, but I think there's some kind of phenomenon with this <laughs> UFL and the Battle Hawks that no other city has, and you know, our one game draws more than the other three games every weekend, and nobody's really watching on TV, and well, I, and I just kind of don't get it. And then there's that other pesky part mm -hmm. of the nearly one billion dollars mm -hmm. that St. Louis took from the NFL. So yes. that probably reduces our chances. As much as I love the idea, I will always hope that something wonderful like that could happen I like again. Bill's clawback. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. You can yeah. have a team a if you give us our money back. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. I think with the Battle Hawks, I, uh, one of our writers at the RFT, Ryan Kroll, uh, coined the term that this is the first fandom powered entirely by spite. Yes. Everybody yeah, wants yeah. to say to the yeah. NFL, hey, we'll show you. And yeah. I do wonder, like, would they come back if the NFL would take them back? I think they probably would. But I think part of this here is, you know, we need more bread and circuses like this is a town where we like our festivals we like to get rowdy we like to drink too much mm -hmm. something like the battle hawks it gives you a great excuse to do it and it's like we don't even care so much if the football's good or bad we just want an excuse to get out there and get rowdy yeah and i've been to a couple games well, and there's well, tailgating yeah, as soon yeah, as the football gets bad i mean look what's happening to the cardinals well that's right I well, mean, you know, every team. They're, they're sacred, but yeah. all of a sudden, <laughs> the their dogs. The never been as rowdy, right? Like, not like mm, football. No, I agree. To get a football team, we'll have to spend about $2 billion on a new oh. stadium. Oh. NFL owners don't pay for that themselves, yeah. and apparently baseball owners don't either, Sarah, mm. because uh, your paper, I think, first reported that the Cardinals are interested in public support for the renovations for the Bush Stadium. I think the Cardinals are so big, they'll get what they want, or at least a large percentage of it, but you don't think so in this environment. Yeah, I mean, I kind of think, read the room. So many people are angry at the Cardinals right now. When we put this story out there initially, I mean, the groundswell of everyone saying, heck no, like, what are they thinking? Give us a winning team first. Um, you know, they almost had to kind of back away from it. They gave a statement to the Business Journal distancing themselves from the whole idea. Well, they were back in about a week floating the same trial balloon with the Post-Dispatch. This is clearly on the team's mind. I think the timing just can't be worse. You have a progressive administration administration at City Hall that isn't necessarily going to want to give a lot of money to stadiums and you have a very angry fandom. Well, I think the DeWitts are still living in the 20th century. I mean, where you know, you could just kind of demand, but you were nice enough to pretend to ask mm -hmm. for the citizens to help pay for this. I mean, and Times have changed. Yeah, well, people, changed. People see that Forbes report, and they do pay some attention to it, about value of franchise. Mm -hmm. And that bottom line is just such that everybody looks. I mean, that's what happened really in Kansas City. We love the Chiefs. We love the Royals. But, man, the Chiefs made billions of dollars over I, the last five years. Why on earth would we give them? even more after Taylor and it's, Travis, it's another, Tate Trav or whatever yeah, yeah. it's called. I think I'm going to invoke the words of, of Ray Hartman the ancient ruins of Bush Stadium 2. I think it's time for a new stadium. <laughs> we need to just build them out of vinyl siding and just, <laughs> right? So that we, we can, can get just whatever knock them down until... Washington University. I, don't I, I, think guys, I don't think you guys are reading the room <laughs> because... This is a sports society where college football coaches are making three million dollars. Yeah, but the, so the players, the, uh, the the linemen on the team are making tens of thousands. There's and no doubt about it. How much is Mizzou throwing into oh. their new stadium right now? Yeah, but that's a lot of donation when you start talking about college Don't. and oh, right. I got that <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and then quite frankly, oh. uh, three oh. of us went to the game Friday. Diamond Sweet tickets. And we said the whole row is empty in front of us. Plenty of room. I bought them <laughs> online. Very much reduced price. But that, I mean, that happens that, for a but while. No, but what I'm saying is, is that right now people aren't flocking down there like right. they used to. So right. things it's, have changed. It's They're May. It's, well, on, but on opening day when the fans booed Mosley. Yeah, that's not good. I mean, that's, that's not good. Opening day is a day of optimism. People are no, crying no, but that happened. for the old days. In 1926, days they booed the owner, Sam Breeden, when he traded, who, Hornus? Uh, <laughs> Hannes Wagner. Hannes Wagner. Yeah. Who but that was a terrible uh, trade. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, you were there. Okay, I haven't been there. Wendy, Wendy. Uh, years. <laughs> Westminster Place, city of St. Louis. A woman builds a, she's renovating a home Why in a historic. are you yelling? <laughs> I don't know, but I'll tell you this. Calm in down. Westminster Place, there is a woman who's renovating her building, her home. Right. She put. She didn't put a slate roof on. Local guidelines say you have to have a slate roof. She put on a much less expensive roof. The preservation board said, take it down. Who's side are you on? 
I can't believe I'm going to say this, the Preservation Board. I think you do your, you have to do your due diligence. I have learned that the hard way. Everybody around this table has learned that the hard way. And unfortunately, when you buy in a historic district, there are strings attached. And I feel terrible for this family, but rules are rules. Well, I don't know. $250,000 for a roof? I mean, I, I have a friend... Uh, uh, He's gone now. He used to live in University City in one of those fancy neighborhoods, and he was very big on roofs. And you know, I said, well, you know, look at my roof, Elliot. And he'd go, well, that's what you put on a fishing shack. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, well, you know I, I, I think that $250,000 for a roof is too much to ask anybody to do. I Ten think it's ridiculous, to too, but, but what, do you do, what do you say to all the people who have paid what they needed to pay for the roof? I, I agree well, with Well, when Wendy. their roof goes bad. Uh, yeah. Okay. I agree with Wendy. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. Okay. It's a roof, by the way. He's from Chicago. <laughs> to be continued. That's how they hey, say. Let's roof. go to the old mailbag and see what the viewers Dogs have to say about roof. last it's week's Chicago, show. It's a roof. From Andrew G. Podleski of Florissant, we heard, whatever happened to your next up programming? I really missed that. So do we, Andrew. Thank you. Melissa Niels of South County wrote, my question is, what is in your coffee cup? <laughs> When did SLU students' rights to shut down public roads take precedence over the rights of the public to use those roads? Thank you, Larry Snowpeck of Alton. And thank you to Mary Garrett of St. Peter's, who wrote, In the 1970s, I requested permits for the students to march from the University of Minnesota to St. Paul after Kent State, and the city council approved, despite short notice. All was peaceful. You can write us care of Donnybrook, 9 PBS, 3655 Olive Street. Don't forget, we love those emails, Donnybrook at 9pbs.org. On social media, use hashtag DonnybrookSTL. Call the 9 line, won't you? 314-512-9094. And listen to us on your favorite podcast source. That's it for this week's program. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to see you next week at this time. Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.